Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. I also hear host of Jedi Council, Christian Harloff. What's going on, guys? Hope everybody had a great weekend. Also here, Mark Ellis. I did have a great weekend. Thank you, Christian. Thank you to all the fans who came out to New York Comic Con to say hi at the booth, at the convention, and at my stand-up comedy shows. Meant a whole lot to me. Good to see everybody back here in LA. Good to have you back, Mark. Did you mean that? Uh, I think I did actually. It was very genuine. I even I was expecting a sarcastic remark after that, <laughs> and it didn't come. I think I'm legitimately happy to see you back. <laughs> All right, what's up? <laughs> okay. The first trailer for Zavon's Power Rangers has debuted online, giving fans a first and good look at the gritty and serious looking movie based on the colorful 90s series. Power Rangers follows five ordinary high school kids who must become something extraordinary when they learn that their small town of Angel Grove and the world is on the verge of being obliterated by an alien threat. The film opens March 24, 2017. John, thoughts on the first Power Rangers trailer? Well, spank my ass and call me Chester. I liked it. I can't, I can't, I can't believe I'm saying it. I can't believe I actually thought it. Look, everybody knows I did a reaction video actually to this or a review of the, the trailer this weekend. It's, it's on our channel. You can go and check it out there on, on our Collider Video YouTube channel. But like, look, I have said from day one that they said this was coming. I think it's a bad idea. You know, that first Power Rangers came out, made 40 million. The second Power Rangers movie came out and made 8 million. So it was a bad idea. Uh, I thought there's no good, but but at the same time, as I always said, there's a way to do this movie that it could be cool. I mean, if you decided to take a certain approach or whatever, it could end up being something kind of cool, but I never believed that they would do it that way. I thought they would just go straight up, you know, campy and what, oh no, so I done. You know, like I thought they would just go kind of stupid right. and whatever. And then this trailer came out and you know what? It's actually pretty good. I, I mean, I was digging it and I got two vibes from the film. From the trailer, at least at any rate, the first vibe I got was a very Breakfast Club kind of vibe to it, right? And so I was, and I was digging it. Now, I mean, come on, who's who's bullying that girl, calling her ugly? That doesn't happen, but whatever. I mean, so far I was digging the Breakfast Club feel, and then there was very much a Chronicle kind of feel to it as well. And I mean that in the absolute best of ways. And this trailer did what I did not think the first Power Rangers trailer would do which has actually made me interested in seeing this movie. Uh, weather forecast, hell is frozen over. Um, but, you know, with, now look, the movie may suck. I'm still kind of half expecting it to suck. But if we're just calling it, like, as we see it with the trailer, I thought the trailer looked pretty good. What did you think? Well, Chester, I think that for me, <laughs> this, is a, this is a movie, when I saw the trailer, I was kind of feeling the same way, and I did get kind of Breast, Breakfast Club meets Chronicle out of the entire thing, and I loved the trailer. I didn't just like it. I loved the trailer. I thought it was a great way to bring in people like us. I, went, I don't know if we need a Power Rangers movie. I think we need a Power Rangers movie. I think this is a good way to tell this story. What kind of threw me off was that when they showed the, that that uh, fan movie that was made, you know, uh, Shankir, mm -hmm. who, was, that, was that his name? The, so Ari, who the guest on Heroes the sh that did the Power Rangers movie. Oh, Max. Ari Shankar, oh, thank, thank you. you. And then Max. had uh, and Katie Sackhoff was in that one. That movie, when it, when that came out, ah, oh, they would never do anything like this because it's too dark. Now that is probably a little bit darker than this, but they definitely are taking the material serious. And I think they're, they're creating the lore, which I really, this, I, this as I'm watching, I'm like, oh, I can see where this is gonna be a franchise. I can see where they're really building up on these characters and how they're kind of putting this together. And the acting looks surprisingly a lot better than I thought it was gonna be. So I was very pleasantly surprised. This was my favorite trailer that I've seen so far out of all the new trailers that came out. I thought it was, I thought it was great. Yeah, the ass bankings continue for me because I also <laughs> really enjoyed this trailer. And I was getting a vibe, and I'm gonna say the name of a movie and you guys are all gonna agree with me that that movie's terrible but the trailers for said movie were not and that is Fantastic Four I like the trailers for Fantastic Four I think they did a good job of setting us up and getting people like myself who weren't that excited about a movie to start to ingratiate themselves and say you know what I do want to go see this same exact thing with Power Rangers what I liked about this trailer is that I didn't grow up and I wasn't like a Power Rangers kid I, I didn't care about them that much but I noticed in the trailer that it did a good job of getting a vibe 
vibe that I think people who weren't fans of the lore into the film, but it also definitely had some hallmarks. So if you were a hardcore Power Rangers fan, you saw certain things in this trailer that you're like, oh, I know that, I remember that. That gets me excited to see this movie. This trailer did a magnificent job of marketing a property that I think is going to get more people excited than they were expecting. All right, folks. Well, as happens sometimes, we've got breaking news that has just come in. Disney, apparently, it's a done deal. Disney is doing a live action Aladdin film, and apparently they are cl getting close to signing director Guy Ritchie to direct the live action Aladdin. I love Guy Ritchie. Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Snatch, I think, is in probably my top 15 films, favorite films of all time. Uh, I loved what he just recently did with The Man of Uncle. There's no word yet. The article in The Hollywood Reporter is currently saying that they still haven't quite decided how they're going to approach the genie. And obviously, I don't think we're going to see man in makeup or man in, 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 uh, in some kind of costume or man in suit. We're going to see a digital character, obviously. But as of right now, it looks like a live-action Aladdin is coming. Guy Ritchie to direct. This kind's kind of weird. Mark, you're just hearing this for the first time. What do you think about this? I think Guy Ritchie is a guy who has a lot of quick, snappy, witty dialogue in his films. And if you need somebody to write stuff for the genie, he might be the right guy to do that. So I wonder how much of a role he's going to have in writing this movie as well as just directing it. He's got the King Arthur movie coming out, which I'm, I don't think that's a movie that needs to be made. The trailer did impress me. And a lot of that was because I thought the dialogue got me into the film. Didn't necessarily feel like it was a time period piece, you know, based on the King Arthur legend, but it did feel like a different spin on it. So if he brings that to Aladdin, I think he might be, while it's not the choice that would have been going off in my head, it actually is a pretty interesting decision, and I like it. Christian, what do you think about this? Um, I knew that, uh, we all knew Aladdin was coming. It made sure. a lot of sense. I don't like the choice of Guy Ritchie at all. I think it's a terrible choice. I think it's a really bad choice, and I think that if you saw the Arthur uh, trailer, I'm not judging it on the movie, because the movie could wind up being fine. I think Guy Ritchie has a very specific Guy Ritchie style that sometimes it turns into a Guy Ritchie movie right away, similar to what happened with Iron Man 3. We've had this conversation many different times on this show to where if you like Iron Man 3 as a Shane Black movie, then you look at it as a Shane Black movie, then that's what it is, and it's a great Shane Black movie, but as an MCU, didn't work. I think that what they've done so far with like Kenneth Branagh, um, Favreau, you didn't, you didn't not need to know that it was their movies. You just needed to know that it was a great director behind the lens. I feel like there's going to be too much craziness in, these, in this trailer for, uh, for, in this film for Aladdin. I don't like the choice at all. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that, A, if they, if, first of all, let's also see how Arthur does. Because I think that if, if, it, if it doesn't, or Cam, whatever it's called, if it doesn't do well, I don't think Guy Ritchie's going to be doing this movie. But we'll really, see. I mean, I, I don't see that that has a lot to do with it because they're not marketing, they're not going to market this movie based on Guy Ritchie directing it the same way that King Arthur is relying on the name what Guy Ritchie. What movie has he done that any movie, whether Snatch and those are very specific, Sherlock, any one of his movies, you know right away from looking at it, like the crate, like this, it doesn't... I disagree. I, I think that we don't have to go any further back than the last movie he did, which was The Man from Uncle, to the point that I even forgot that Guy Ritchie That's directed one that The I Man can, from I Uncle. I can give you that one, but other than I that... I think he brought a very different sensibility the, to it. The, the Sherlock movies, I thought they were really good, quick, storytelling films, and when you go back to Lockstock and Snatch and stuff like that, it's... I, I, I would agree with your hesitation that you don't want Aladdin to feel like a Guy Ritchie movie, but you gotta think they've been having talks about this, Maybe. and the vision that he has for Aladdin. Disney can have anybody that they want doing the Aladdin movie. So you have to think that in their negotiations or their discussions that Guy Ritchie came into the office and they had the same apprehension that you do, where they're saying, oh, we don't want this to be a Guy Ritchie movie. So it's probably not going to be a lot of F-bombs in Aladdin, but it also isn't going to feel like <laughs> his previous... <laughs> I would like to see Aladdin with a bunch of F-bombs. I'm sorry, but... like, what's your second wish? Yeah. 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 I, 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 I think some of my uh, excitement about this news comes from the fact that it is Disney and it's not like they're just they're grasping at straws to get a famous director doing it they can have anybody that they want and because they are going to have Guy Ritchie I think he probably has a cool spin on it I Maybe will so. say though I, I where I tend to where I understand where it comes from is this something you said would that have been would Guy Ritchie have been the first name that hit my head no because that question of fit does come into mind it wouldn't wouldn't have been in the top 10 picks I would have had, but I do love him as a director. And as Kevin Feige told us when we asked him about, why do you go out and get this dude James Gunn, who's done the, like these little kind of sci-fi films? He goes, 
Because somebody knows how to tell a good story is somebody knows how to tell a good story. You're, you're right. And because, we'll we'll see. Maybe it'll be great. Maybe it won't. You're right. Because I was, they did the same thing with Peyton Reed. And I oh, don't. Yeah, that's and, it's, true too. and it's not one of these things to where I'm like, oh, no, it's going to be terrible because Guy Ritchie is a good director. He is. And there has been things that he's done that I have loved. I just particularly when I hear Aladdin. Think right. of, and, and, and honestly, that Arthur thing really put me off. I thought that Arthur trailer was awful. I kind of liked it. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I did like it. And for no other reason, I think this is cool news because it's Disney taking a risk with a, with a director where, you know, Favreau is a great choice, but obviously also a very safe choice to do The Lion King. Right, and, because of what they just did with Jungle right. Book. And, and, say, and, and you can say that Marvel sometimes is very safe with some of the, the, the character decisions that they've made in movies. So this is Disney saying we are going to step out on a ledge here a little bit with Guy Ritchie, see if it pays off. But it's a good, the good point that we'll have to keep our eye on. Will this be a fit? It's a good movie, good director, but will they be a good fit? I am curious. So Ashley Mova, as the future Princess Jasmine in the live action <laughs> oh movie, my God. Uh, what do you think about this? <laughs> I am so ecstatic for this. I've just been waiting for this to this news to break. I knew I knew it was right around the corner, but um, I'm really excited to see what they do with the genie. I hope that they give kind of a nod to Robin Williams in some way, and I think that this is a um, a really great opportunity for different backgrounds to get more involved in Hollywood. And Ashley Mova for Princess. Jasmine, you know? <laughs> uh, Ashley, it's actually the second report of Boris Kitt's thing here says that Margot Robbie's in negotiation for Jasmine. Oh, I thought it was going to be yep. Tilda Swinton. <laughs> 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 All right, let's move on to our second official story of the day. Lionsgate has unveiled the first trailer for the highly anticipated sequel, John Wick Chapter 2. The film finds Keanu Reeves reprising the title role as legendary hitman John Wick, who is forced once again out of retirement when a former associate plots to seize control of a shadowy international assassin. Sins Guild. Chad Stahelski, one half of the directing team behind John Wick, directs Solo this time around as the franchise takes the action to Rome. Stahelski also spoke to Collider's uh, Aubrey Page at New York Comic Con this past weekend, where the director revealed plans for a third movie are already in the works. John Wick Chapter 2 opens February 10, 2017. Mark, what do you think of the first trailer for John Wick Chapter 2? Very, very big fan of John Wick and now the franchise that extends into that first trailer we saw because it was awesome. It was everything I want to see in a John Wick movie. And that starts with seeing the dog. There's a new dog. It's happy. It's healthy. It's going to stay healthy <laughs> the entire movie. Right, John Wick fans? And it's going to have its sequel in John Wick 3, too. So I, usually you don't want to green light sequels or have discussions about sequels before you see if this one plays well. They know what they have on their hands here. And... If the fan reaction in New York when this thing dropped is any indication, people who love John Wick love John Wick 2, and they're going to love John Wick 3. They seem to have a total lock on what this franchise is. Getting to see the hallmarks. You get to see the guy from the Continental again. You get to see Lawrence Fishburne show up. You get to see John Wick with a lot of cool-looking action gunplay. It's everything I wanted to see in a John Wick trailer. This did not leave me flat at all. Very excited about this movie. I had two big questions going into watching this trailer, or even into the movie as a whole. Question number one, will we get to see the Continental again? Mm -hmm. The trailer answers that question because we see several of the personnel from the Continental. It's good to see you back, John Wick, mm -hmm. so soon. That was great. Number two, I wanted to see a dog, and we saw the dog. Now, what would have made this trailer perfect? And I know nothing about the script, but I'm almost willing to put money on this. I'm willing to put money that we get to see the dog kill somebody in this movie. I, like, I would have loved to have seen uh, like some mobster, some assassin go kill the dog and then just quick cut to the dog jumping on somebody's throat and tearing their throat out. I would love to I see would that if that. it wasn't a blue pit bull because pit bulls well, have enough yes, of a bad yeah. rap. Yes, that's true. If it was like a German yeah, shepherd yeah. and he snapped his fingers and it turned into like army German shepherd mode, that's cool. What if it's another baby beagle puppy ripping out some guy's throat? <laughs> yeah, let's get Molly to rip somebody's throat out. That, that would, sounds that like that a would good be idea. Good. Christian, what do you think? I'm so happy this trailer was awesome. <laughs> I, like, it, it, it's just because, you know, there are a few and far between the the action franchise isn't what it used to be in the in the 80s and 90s and to have one like this and because the scenes even in these little trailers of the, the it, very similar to what we saw in the first movie the way that they're using the gun fighting and stuff too the, it, this is going to be a fun movie i love the fact that it's a franchise i love the fact that the same team is involved with it i like that they they've said that they had an idea for where it's going um it seems that way i like that they're just utilizing what they're doing in europe over there like just you could you could feel it you felt that you're and feel like just uh, as he's getting fitted for the suits and everything too. It's it's this movie looks like a lot of crazy over the top fun that I can't wait to see. And I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna call out the elephant in the room right now is that what makes me a little nervous about John Wick 2 is a movie called Taken 2. 
And when that trailer came out, I thought it was a good trailer, but I was also a little nervous because he's given the same speech that he gave in the first movie. Here, we saw shades of the first movie. We saw some nods to the original, but it looks like it's going to be telling a different story. It's going to be its own movie as opposed to just relying on the cool stuff that we saw like the Continental as the only vehicle going forward. Well, I think the difference is with, with both with Taken 2, I believe it was a different director, also a different team that was involved with Taken 2. There's only so much you can do with that particular premise as with this guy obviously has this this history. There's more things for him to do. There's there's this overall universe that they set up really well right. in the part one with the Continental and other type of assassins. There's way more that they can do than just the, they're kind of pigeonholed and taken. You know, it's in like the one way thing. and in the same way that we love '80s and '90s action movie heroes, the beginning of this trailer building it up where you're where if you're sitting in a theater and this thing comes on, you're like, I'm not sure what we're watching here yet. You see him fitting the suit. You start to get and it's like then you see Keanu Reeves with the new facial do hair. It's awesome. You know, something that's interesting about this, too, is that when the first John Wick movie came out, the studio did not have a lot of faith in it. They didn't drop the first trailer till about a month mm-hmm. out. It kind of felt like they were hiding the movie, and that's why a lot of us felt like, oh, a, a Keanu Reeves movie about a hitman. Okay, this is going to be a throwaway movie. And I think it surprised the studio as much as it surprised us about just how good that movie was and how the audience responded to it. Now it feels like they may be overcompensating a little bit by not only you know putting the marketing out and doing a full marketing push, but they're also already announcing a third one. What was also pretty interesting to see is you can always rely on Common. Con, right. like with, true, right. with, it kind of feels like he's got the same kind of role as he did in Wanted. Mm-hmm. Remember the the sass with the curved bullets? Yeah. Kind of the same guy who's going to pop in there, be a foil, and he's always good in those types of roles too. So I was kind of excited to see that. All right, what's next? It's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. In its first weekend in release, The Girl on the Train took the number one spot, coming up a bit shy of expectations with $24.7 million. Ms. Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children took the number two spot with $15 million and $51 million total in domestic. Deepwater Horizon came in at number three with $11.75 million. In its third weekend in release, The Magnificent Seven took the number four spot with $9.15 million. And rounding out the top five was WB Storks with $8.45 million and a domestic cum of $50.1 million. Christian, thoughts on the weekend box office? Uh, it's not too surprising. It looks fairly predictable, to be honest. And the, the Girl on the Train, I didn't love the movie, and I don't think you did either. I don't think anybody on this table did, but it was a very popular book. And right. There yeah. were a lot of people that wanted and, and the marketing looked very good. Well, it was the movie real, looked It was very really good, good yeah. marketing. The trailer's really good. And it's, some people who have seen it think that it's it's um, better than I think it is. But uh, it's it's $25 million, I think, is a decent opening for that film. Peregrine, Peregrine hitting another $15 million. Uh, you know that that movie will tap out. Uh, it, it was pretty expensive, though, wasn't it, to make that film? Uh, Peregrine? Miss Peregrine's its I budget it is listed at uh, it, it, actually that and Deepwater Horizon both cost a little over hundred million to yeah. make. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think that they both are going to tiptoe towards making their at least their their domestic budget uh, back. So we'll see. But I, I, no, nothing really surprises me so much. It looks pretty pretty predictable. What do you think? I would hope Deepwater Horizon would. It doesn't look like that one's going to, which is a bummer because I don't think Deepwater Horizon is necessarily a movie that's going to translate to a worldwide market and make a lot of money overseas. It's a really good movie and it's really intense and it tells a great true story. And it's 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 getting beat by Miss Peregrine's, which, uh, you know, has the Tim Burton name power. It looks like a cool, you know, X-Men for kids kind of movie vibe. I didn't like that movie as much. I also didn't like The Girl on the Train that much. I'll agree with you guys, though. The marketing for The Girl on the Train is why it came in at number one. One. And it also really helps that a movie like Gone Girl came out last year, which a lot of people are comparing it to. That movie stole the fall for a lot of people. It made a lot of money, and it was based on a novel, and it looked like it had similar mysterious vibes that you're getting with The Girl on the Train. So it's not a surprise for me that it's number one in the box office. I would like to see Deepwater Horizon doing better. Yeah, I I'm, I was not thrilled with The Girl on the Train. Actually, the more I think about it, the less I liked it. But what is interesting is that all the films that are still on the list none of them dropped more than 50%. All of them dropped under 50% mm-hmm. in their follow-up weeks, including Miss Peregrine's. But really, look, Miss Peregrine's is going to lose money for the studio. I mean, that's just a foregone conclusion at this point. Unfortunately, Deepwater Horizon is going to lose money for the studio, which is really unfortunate because it's really good. It's actually quite a good movie. Uh, Magnificent Seven is going to be profitable. Storks will have to wait and see. What is interesting is the two other wide-release films that opened up against Girl on the Train uh, failed to make the top five. Birth of a Nation failed to break the top five. 
five. Maybe a lot of speculation about the controversies going yeah. on behind the camera. And middle school, the worst years of my life, which I don't think any of us had any desire to see or any interest whatsoever. For all I know, it was the best movie of the year. I was I just, surprised I didn't see it. it did as well. It, it made almost $7 million. Which, and yes, it was surprised me too. under 3,000 screens. And its budget is like probably under $10 million too. So I, I think middle school, if, if which is also based on a novel, I believe, or a book. So if you're a fan of that book, I hope that that source material translated to the screen better than Girl on the Train did. I have one other quick question, though. Were you surprised at all that, look, all these films dropping less than 50%, is that a commentary, do you think, on that the movies were good enough to drop 50%, or do you think it was a commentary on the week outing more of the new films that opened up this week? No, I think it was more that it's, it's I think the movies themselves, if you look at them, they're all pretty good movies. They're all they're all fairly decent films in the word of mouth for I mean I again I haven't seen Deepwater Horizon but like I said with Girl on the Train it, it has that audience itself so you knew that, that was going to open up at number one Magnificent Seven I thought was was a movie that it was a fun popcorn western and Storks is the only kids movie out there right now right. so I think that's pretty much why they're all doing uh, pretty well and Deepwater Horizon for those who have seen it have been singing its praises and I and I need to go and see that movie it's one of the things I want to do so I think it's a matter of that the word of mouth for the movies that are out there right now it's what's helping them all right guys we reached out part of the show for buy or sell here's how this works in front of her ass she's got a few other items in the world of movie news she's going to run them down then those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So Ashley, what do we got? According to Variety, Forrest Whitaker is moving from one massive Disney franchise to another. The Rogue One star has signed on for Black Panther, Marvel's upcoming superhero pick starring Chadwick Boseman. Whitaker will play the role of Zuri, an elder statement in Wakanda. The rap adds to the report, saying that Florence Kasumba has joined the cast as well, reprising her Captain America Civil War as AO. Black Panther is scheduled to hit theaters on February 16, 2018. John Byersell, Forrest Whitaker, and Black Panther. Academy Award winning actor joining a comic book movie? Yeah, I buy it, but I gotta tell you this little story. I went uh, about <laughs> half the weekend <laughs> misinterpreting the story. You gotta say, see, Friday, I walk into the office, right? And there's Mark Riley telling me, hey, John, did you know Forrest Whitaker just signed on to, to be in Black Panther? However, what I heard him say was, Forrest Griffin signed on. For those of you who know UFC, Forrest Griffin is an iconic, legendary, and absolutely hilarious UFC fighter. He's written a couple books that some of the funniest things you've ever read. You should check him out. So I went half the weekend thinking Forrest Griffin had joined, had joined Black Panther to the point that later on in the day when my wife came up, she said, hey, did you hear that Forrest Whitaker joined Black Panther? I corrected her sternly saying, no, honey, it's actually Forrest Griffin joined Black Panther. Yeah, never do that. Never, yeah. <laughs> ever try to correct your wife. Um, this is fantastic news. Forrest Whitaker is awesome. I cannot wait to see him, obviously. This is them keeping it in the family. Can't wait to see him in Star Wars Rogue One. Now he's going to be in Black Panther. Look, you put him in anything, he's going to deliver. Even He's done a lot of these cheap little throwaway movies in the last couple of years. But even when he's in those, you watch those and go, damn, he can really act. So I think this is going to do nothing but elevate it. I buy it. It's a huge buy for me. I mean, this is not only adding talent to a project, but I think that Forrest Whitaker has already been in the conversation. But with Rogue One coming out at the end of this year, he could join that rarefied air of somebody like uh, like a Michael Caine or like a Morgan Freeman, where every time they're on screen and it's because th they get a little bit older and we give them that, that that dignity of being the elder statesman, the voice of authority in every movie. I mean, just look at the lines that he has in the Rogue One trailer when you're excited about all the action stuff. But when Forrest Whitaker starts talking, you're just like, this guy knows what he's talking about. He has things to teach us. I think it might be the same kind of role in Black Panther. And I would buy him playing anybody in this movie. The description of his character as somewhat of an elder statesman makes even that much more sense. Christian. Yeah, I mean, come on. He, he elevates a lot of movies that he's in for sure. Like even those Rogue One trailers when he pops up, it's just like mm -hmm. you, your eyes were already on it on the Star because it's Star Wars, but they really start to fixate more because you see Forrest Whitaker there, Forrest right. Griffin. Um, but <laughs> but the, you know, I, the other thing is I think that is also what's really great about this, what people should be talking about. I think that you know, African-American or black actors in general, actresses, would want to be a part of this, would want to be a part of this movie. This is something that we've, we haven't had a mainstream movie, superhero movie, with predominantly all black actors and actresses and a black director. This is something that's really big, you know? So yeah, of course they're gonna want to get somebody like a Forrest um, Whitaker for sure, because like you also said, keeping it in the family, 
they're doing the same thing possibly with Tessa Thompson if they go ahead right. and put her in Han yeah. Solo because she's in, she's in Thor. So this is something that Disney has done, will continue to do, and you're putting him in there as Big Buy. Just a, a quick note of correction. Yeah. Uh, you're forgetting about Black Dynamite. I said mainstream. Oh, okay. mainstream, fine, mainstream fine, movie fine. because Blade, I'll let that I will, go. yeah, mainstream for by, sure. By the way, if you have not seen Black Dynamite with Michael Jai White, check out Black Dynamite. It's absolutely hilarious, especially if you live in the LA area because there's a lot of LA living kind of little quips in it. You should absolutely check that out. All right, what's next? Thanks to a report from Vulture, Daniel Craig has clarified his statements about returning as James Bond. Taking the stage at the New Yorker Festival this past Friday night, the actor was asked if he was ever going to play James Bond again. Recalling his slash my wrist statement, Craig said, mm -hmm. they say that S sticks and that definitely stuck. Joking then aside, Craig clarified his position while also confirming there have been no conversations about the next James Bond film, adding, as far as I'm concerned, I've got the best job in the world. I'll keep doing it as long as I still get a kick out of it. If I were to stop doing it, I would miss it terribly. Mark Byers saw the idea of Daniel Craig actually returning as James Bond. Oh, you made it so much easier for me, Ashley. I thought you were going to ask Byers sell that he's going to be James Bond again, which is a very hard decision. The idea of it, I would have to sell it. As much as I've enjoyed Daniel Craig as James Bond in two movies, it seemed like he was not happy to be there in the most recent one, and I think it's time to inject some fresh life into the James Bond suit, as has happened from time to time in this universe. It's time to get a new James Bond. I think Daniel Craig, a lot of these comments were based on how much money is reported to be on the table if he was to return to play <laughs> James Bond. So the idea of him being in one more Bond movie I don't hate it because I think that he might be up for a redemption. Like, well, no, look at how much I do care about this character and how much ass I can kick as James Bond. But for me personally as a fan, I'd sell it and rather see somebody else don the tuxedo. I'm going to disagree with you. I'm going to buy that I would love to see him come back as this. And there were several problems with, with Spectre. I mean, there, there were. But I, I personally, as an audience member, I didn't think the performance that Daniel Craig gave was one of them. I thought he was putting as much effort into it as he did the other ones. But that was just my perception as an audience member. But, you know, we always talked about this, too, when those comments came out by him about, you know, I think I'd rather, you know, cut my own wrists or mm -hmm. whatever. I, we always added the little asterisk, you know, hey, look, that could be taken out of context. It could just be the words of an exhausted actor, you know, having just finished a big shoot. And, you know, he said this, too. He clarified those statements. He said this. He goes, those comments, it was the day after filming had stopped on Spectre. I'd been away from home for a year. The physical strains of the role combined with the distance from my family take a toll. He said, Craig was careful, though, about not seeming to complain too much. He did stress that uh, that no conversation has taken place yet. But as in what Ashley read, he does want to come back. He's mm -hmm. looking forward to coming back. And I think if he wants to come back, let him come back. I think personally that Craig's got two or three more Bond films in him. We'll just have to see how they turn out at this point. Anyway, what do you think? Uh, it's so loaded. Uh, I, I, buy, I buy the idea of him being in another one because I want a mulligan from the last movie. Uh, I want to see what he can do one more time. I'd like to see an idea of a Daniel Craig as Bond again because the last movies, a couple movies he's been in have been really good, minus, well, two out of the four, I guess. Um, and there is potential with him as Bond. If it was a matter of buying or selling the comments, I'm going to sell the comments because the thing here's, oh, yeah, what happened was that they probably started getting, listen, we're going to offer you more money. But please start saying nice things about us. <laughs> like and that that's what it, it was it's it was we talked about this last time we brought this up. It was it's a negotiation thing. It's a now now oh no no, of course I'd want to play it. Yeah, because there's big offers on the table. His agents are calling him up and going, Stop, stop. We need to, don't say don't say those things like you did in the past. Don't say those things. We need to try to negotiate to see because you don't know, you don't want to walk away from this. But because he let the emotions and stuff the way that he was talking at the time, he was clearly not happy. Is that gonna happen again when the next deal happens? You know, it's, I happen to agree with Mark to where I just think that we'd be okay with finding another Bond at this point, too, because I certainly said this last time, Bond is bigger than the actor. Now, that being said, if they did cast him once or kept him once again, I'd be okay with it because I do like what he's done so far with the character. I just don't know if they need the headache and maybe they can spend the money on a, on a Bond that wants to be there a little longer. But he, here's, here's the other question, too, is if they announce that there's a different director that's going to be doing this new James Bond movie. And that director got us really excited. And, audit, and we said, oh, well, Daniel Craig wants to work with this guy. Because maybe it was a lot of him working with Sam Mendes again. That for whatever reason, it was Sam Mendes was the reason why Spectre didn't feel like it had any life or energy to it. And if that's the but case... But he did the other one, too, though. He did Skyfall. Yeah. It was great. And, but Spectre was... It just felt flat. 
and there's a reason why it was That's flat. the best word for it, flat. And yeah. it's hard yeah. for me to decipher as a viewer if that was more Daniel Craig's performance or Sam Mendes' direction or both. All right, what's next? Just a few days ago, Ben Affleck apparently confirmed that the title of his forthcoming solo Batman movie would be called The Batman, as was rumored for a while. Now the actor is taking back what he said a bit, trying to remind everyone that the movie doesn't exist until it does. Taking part in a Facebook Live video on E! News to promote the accountant, Affleck said, I mentioned the other day it's been around for a long time, but the movie, there is no Batman movie happening yet. We're still trying to figure it out, you know. Get the script and budget and all that stuff. And someone said what are you calling it and I had said like back when we were promoting another movie I was like we don't have a name for it we're just going with the Batman or Batman movie and I said that and everyone was like Affleck announces the name of his Batman movie Christian Byer saw the solo Batman movie being called the Batman I, I still buy that it's gonna be called the Batman I uh, you know I, whether or not he was supposed to say it at the time who knows or maybe I, I still think that they're gonna wind up calling it the Batman I don't know whether or not he, that's all legit or if it's just like we're not supposed to say anything yet but I, I also think that he's someone that will look more to what the overall opinion is I do I do and I think that some he I don't know I, I hearing all of these comments makes me think that we're gonna get the Batman movie regardless yeah I look I why that it's going to be called the Batman it's just the perfect title but like he said even when this story first came out he said hey it could change whatever and we know it could change this is so early in the process they could come up with a thousand other ideas and I respect and I buy the comments he's making now he's trying to temper people's expectations because look until it's locked in stone it's not locked in stone but I do believe it's going to end up being called the Batman I do believe that's the right title for the movie especially as the first solo movie and what's probably going to be its own standalone franchise it's just a good one to start with so I buy his comments but I also buy this going to be called the Batman what do you think uh, I, yeah I buy both as well it will be called the Batman in my opinion and I think that this was supposed to get out when it did get out last week because we had a conversation it might have been because of a, a viewer wrote in on mailbag question about DC doing a great job this year about their social media presence and making announcements kind of time to to beat up whatever Marvel was going to do. And while I don't necessarily agree that DC is just looking at Marvel then waiting to release nuggets of information, I do think that the Batman coming out when it did was on purpose because it got people excited. There's a huge comic book convention coming out later that week, and they wanted people talking about DC properties, namely the Batman, the one that everybody was excited about because they saw him be awesome in Batman versus Superman. I think it's going to be called the Batman. Maybe Affleck's backtracking a little bit. I don't think he got a slap on the wrist or anything for saying no. that it's going to be called the Batman because if you're DC, you don't slap Ben Affleck on the wrist. You will let him talk about whatever he wants to talk about as long as it's positive things about Batman. I think it's going to be called the Batman as it, as it should be. All right, what's next? A new trailer has been released for Zhang Jimu's upcoming fantasy epic, The Great Wall, starring Matt Damon. The movie tells the story of an elite force making a stand for humanity on the world's most iconic structure. It opens on February 17, 2017. We've also got a new trailer from Underworld Blood Wars, directed by newcomer Anna Foresters. The movie sees Kate Beckinsale returning as immortal vampire Celine, taking on the Lycan's new leader who wants Celine and her hybrid daughter's blood. The film will hit theaters on January 6, 2017. 2017. And lastly, the sixth and final installment of the Resident Evil franchise is entitled Resident Evil The Final Chapter. Almost almost 15 years after the original film's release, this last go-around will return to the source of the trouble as Alice finds herself traveling to the Hive in Raccoon City. There, she and her group of survivors will take on the well-armed forces of the Umbrella. John, buy us all the new trailers for Great Wall, Resident Evil, and Underworld. This is a great example of of not always bad trailers don't always equal bad movies good trailers don't always equal good movies uh, I, I'm gonna sell the, the wall China one I thought that it looked bad it felt bad and but I'm guessing the movies probably gonna be pretty good but the trailer to me looked awful it, it, it's not what I was expecting I wasn't expecting a monster movie I haven't been keeping close tabs on the film so that was a bit of a surprise a pleasant surprise at first but then I'm just watching it's like the visuals look terrible the pacing like just Matt Damon felt out of place to me and then oddly enough I'm going to buy the Underworld and the Resident Evil ones I don't think the Underworld films have been any good I, I, like, I kind of like the first one and I've always believed in the premise but each movie has failed to deliver on the promise so I'll check it out but I don't have a lot of hope and I have no doubt like zero doubt that Resident Evil is going to be awful I have no doubt about that I'm willing to put money on that 
But if we're talking about the trailer, I got to say, I, I thought they made a pretty good trailer. I thought the trailer didn't look bad at all. And so uh, I'm going to I'm gonna sell the Wall of China one. I'm going to buy both the Underworld and the Resident Evil one. You're looking at me kind of funny. What do you think about that? <laughs> I'm going to sell all three of these and, oh, and thank you for taking them off my hands. Uh, <laughs> All of them were bad. I mean, although I thought I thought the other two made Great Wall of China look like the Dark Knight trailer compared to uh, the, the Great Wall of China. I'll tell you, I love Matt Damon is one of my favorite actors. He looked terrible in in this movie, like acting wise. Stuff the, the lines that he was reading out, it felt like Dragonheart or or what? It, it felt real wow, bad. Wow, you went there. Visually, you though, went to Dragonheart. Vis visually, the movie actually looks pretty cool. There are some cool scenes here and there that I was like, okay, this we, we could be blown away visually while watching this movie. So I agree, when we see it in the theater, it might actually transfer better. This is not a movie I'm going to complain about whitewashing because th this particular story kind of calls for these two outsiders to play, and, and it's not historically accurate and stuff too. So I, that particular one, I'm going to stay away from that argument. But I didn't like what I was saying. I like that uh, Pedro Pascal is in this movie, and I from yep. Game of Thrones. I, I really hope that he. That it looks like there's going to be a lot of focus on him. I hope that they that he can kind of step up into a mainstream audience here. So that is that. The other two just totally. I, I don't agree that they're good trailers. I think they look exactly like the. I couldn't. Even, if I to me, if I see a trailer like this from a movie that's a fifth or sixth or seventh movie into it, I want to be able to know. Oh, that's the third one. That's the fourth one. If I watch this, I couldn't tell you if it was the second movie, mm. the third movie. They all look exactly the same. And and I could be talking about both of these trailers because Resident Evil, the last one. No, it's not. You're gonna torture me with another one of these crap boxes in like two <laughs> more years. It's it's the same thing, and I don't understand why it's post-apocalyptic and Mila Jovovich still wearing makeup. I don't understand any of this stuff that I'm watching, so I sell everything. you got to have your priorities in a post-apocalyptic yeah. world. Mark, what do you think? Oh, boy, this is tough. For the, the easy call to make is that I can't buy both the Underworld and the Resident Evil trailers, and it comes down to which Game of Thrones character do I most want to see <laughs> in one of those trailers. And it's a tough call between Tywin Lannister and Ser Jorah, Captain Friendzone. I'm going to have to sell the Captain Friendzone one because the, the Resident Evil one, it just, I agree with Christian where it just looks like it's not going to be the last time. It's never, ever, ever going to be the last time. And this trailer didn't do anything to engage me as somebody who's not a fan of these films to make me want to see that. I think I'm going to buy the Underworld trailer, though. I think that was more of an exciting return where you see Kate Beckinsale's character on screen again. And I liked that Charles Dance's performance in that makes me feel like he really cares about this material for whatever reason. And there's just something about that blue Instagram filter that they make all these movies in yeah. that just gets me excited for whatever reason. I don't know what it is, but I will buy the Underworld trailer. The Great Wall is the one that I was struggling with the most. Um, and I'm going to have to sell it barely because... I will agree that I think that seeing more of the story made me less concerned about the whitewashing aspect of it, but the visuals I thought looked terrible. Oh. I thought the CGI looked like, as much as I love this movie, it looked like Mortal Kombat in 94. Like yeah. It did not look like good special effects at all. I did like the scene where Matt Damon shoots the cup, though, and it like that was kind of cool. That, that was, was kind of cool. cool. That was very Young Guns 2-ish, but yeah, the visual effects really let me down. All right, guys. Well, listen, we do this show live. And so what we do every day is we save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take some of your live Twitter questions. You can start firing those questions in right now. Simply follow us on Twitter at Collider Video. Fire in your questions and Wendy will pick out a couple to ask at the end of the show. But I want to remind you, too, that Movie Talk isn't the only show that's airing on Collider Video today. A little bit later today at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, the new episode of TV Talk drops. And... Right before we started shooting, Dennis and Perry did a little reaction video to the John Wick 2 trailer. Ooh. That'll be online once this show is done. Make sure you check that out on our Collider video channel. All right, it is time for Mailbag. Listen, guys, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Send out in your questions. Maybe you'll see it on Movie Talk. Maybe you'll see it on our Saturday and Sunday Mailbags. But you won't see it at all unless you send in a question. So, Ashley, what have we got picked out? Ben Landers writes, I love your show. It's my daily go-to. The only thing that annoys me is that you guys seem to hate Crash, the Oscar winner. It is one of my favorite films of all time. Yes, it bangs you over the head with its racism message, but wasn't that the point? Was it that you guys think it wasn't Oscar worthy and that was the issue? Um, I myself have never banged on Crash. Yeah. I like Crash. I like Crash very much. Actually, I think the majority of the people around here do. Where you hear most of the criticism, though, is not that Crash wasn't a good movie. I, I th I'll argue very strongly that Crash is a really good movie. 
is that it did probably didn't deserve to win Best Picture, though. Uh, because when it goes up against movies like Brokeback Mountain, Capote, uh, Good Night and Good Luck, and Munich, I'll make the argument that Crash might have been the fifth best on that list. I certainly thought Capote was better. I certainly thought Munich was better. Um, so it's not that it wasn't a great movie. It was a great movie, and I even have no problem that it was nominated for Best Picture. I think, though, what you're interpreting as people hating on Crash is probably more often than not people hating on the notion that it won Best Picture. I don't know, Mark, how would you answer this? I would answer it pretty much the same way. It felt like Crash was almost like, it's not as good of a movie as something like Argo, but where Argo, it felt like it got snubbed in some other categories. It's almost like the Crash winning Best Picture was a makeup because there were so many stars in that movie. There were so many different storylines coming together that it felt more like a Best Picture candidate. Um, it, it wasn't a Shakespeare in Love situation where I thought it was completely unworthy of winning the award. And I really like that movie. I haven't seen it in like 10 years. So I've never really, I don't mention Crash a lot. Like in Daily Conversation, I'm not just like hanging out with you guys, having lunch and be like, well, let's talk about Crash some more. You know, <laughs> it's, it's a good movie. I really liked it. Yeah, I'm curious to who he was referring to as far as not liking Crash, because I've never seen it. Um, <laughs> I've actually never seen Crash, so I've never really spoken that I didn't like it or not. So I don't know which panelists he meant, but um, I know that there's some people that maybe didn't think that it should have gotten all the praise, but I don't know who specifically. I mean, I've heard here. that talk like in, here? you know, it, no, n n not necessarily here, yeah. but like you see it online where like Crash isn't like, it's not, it's not Braveheart, you know, it's not like, oh, that, that was the best movie of the year. And we remember that year as being the year Crash won, but not every movie is going to do that. Not every movie you're going to remember the year it came out because it won the Academy Award and everybody knew it was going to, and it was so lopsided. It was a narrow victory, I think, over Brokeback Mountain or over Munich, but I, I thought it earned it just fine. All right, what's next? Kurt Daniels writes, I know that the basic opinion expressed is that the defenders will have a very minimal part in the Infinity War, if one at all, mostly because of the awkward interaction with the established characters in the MCU. But hear me out. What if Thanos were to send some minions to New York City to find and obtain a certain artifact from a strange doctor who happens to live there, but the Avengers are too busy in another galaxy to deal with it? Wouldn't that be an opportunity for the defenders to shine on the big screen by kicking some cannon fodder ass and maybe even spy? Spider-Man could be in on that action. This is a very specific scenario you're painting. <laughs> um, look here, actually it's funny because John Schnepp and I on our show Film HQ, which you can watch on Comic-Con HQ, make sure you subscribe to that today. Um, I think it was a week ago or two weeks ago we did a little debate segment where we debated this very issue. Should the Defenders show up in the Infinity War? And here's the main reason why I don't think they should. I don't want to see the Defenders show up in the Infinity War because they, while they keep dropping very vague hints that they're in the same world, they really do a lot to keep them separate in many ways. Like, you're never going to see Tony Stark pop up in, you know, in Jessica Jones. You're never, you're never going to see that. They don't seem to want to cross the streams. And here's my concern. Because I just finished watching Luke Cage last week. And I really like Luke Cage. I thought it was really good. And I love what they're doing with their Netflix universe. But one of the great things about Luke Cage was that, for, at least for the first half of the season, as I hit the, I'm, I'm, there we go. <laughs> oh my God, oh my God, he's shrinking. He's shrinking, he's gone. Um, one of the great things about Luke Cage is that like the, the first half of the season is him trying to take down a local drug dealer. He's trying to take down a local, like a, a, a local thug. And you know, in, in Daredevil, he's taking out like local Russian dudes who, who are kidnapping kids and stuff like that. You can tell those types of stories in these finite, arenas like Hell's Kitchen or or Harlem or wherever, and you can tell those stories and make them feel grounded and great and important. My concern is if you now cross the streams and suddenly throw like the defenders, we're talking about Iron Fist or Luke Cage or Daredevil or Jessica Jones, and now they're fighting a cosmic entity and they're fighting a world invasion. If you then go back to Luke Cage dealing with, with a local crime lord or, or Daredevil taking on Kingpin, suddenly now, instead of those neighborhood level stories feeling grounded and important and, and deep and great, they're gonna almost feel insignificant. Like, wait a minute, just two weeks ago, I, I saw Daredevil fighting, like hitting Thanos over the head with his, with his stick and now he's taken on drug dealer number three from the local high school, bah, you know? I, I just really love the feel that they have crafted with these Netflix shows. Even though I wasn't a big fan of Jessica Jones, I loved what they were going for, and I loved what they've done with the Daredevil season one, two, and Luke Cage. 
And I think you need to protect that. And I think suddenly taking them out of those environments, having them fight Avenger level villains and galactic problems and all that kind of stuff, you then can't go back home again. And I'm afraid it would damage what they've done with the Netflix universe so far. That's my fear. I don't know. How would you answer that? I think I'm going to go the other way with it. I think that they um, it, eventually the series, whether it's Daredevil season three or four by the time that Infinity War comes out, they're going to have to go to new levels. They're going to have to do new things and fight new villains. Jessica Jones and Luke Cage obviously going to be a little earlier on into their seasons, but I think because of their abilities and things that they can do, and I think that if it's done in the right way, depending on how they shoot the the scenes, that they, if they are in the, in the Infinity War, how they make it work, I think it's possible. And I think it's also possible to keep that realism and keep that grittiness and keep the smaller things that they do because – it's their job. It's what they're going to be able to, like, the worlds will be different. They'll have to also incorporate that into the Netflix series of how the worlds would be different after a Thanos invasion happens. I know that you, you, you've kind of went over this in great length, that they've almost tried to distance themselves from the film they'll, universe. They'll reference the events of the Infinity Wars as the next the incident and they'll just move on. Yeah, and I hope that they, they, they don't do that. I hope that they add some more, like if it's it's like a big kind of catastrophic event that happens down down the line with when Thanos coming into the world. I hope they do reference it because I think if they don't and the defenders are not involved in it at all, it's just kind of weird how like, oh yeah, what happened? Well, this thing happened, but hey, let's go get the crime well, that's of the week. That's what they did with the, the, the Chitin the invasion. I know, but, that, mm -hmm. but that, was also, that was also 2011 when that movie came out, so we were about four or five years past. It, it, it'll be, we're right in the midst of it all. Like it, that universe is now happening the same time this, you know, like, this movie is happening point. too. So I would like to see it. I think that if it's done correctly, it could be done poorly and the whole thing goes to crap, but if it's done well, I think it'd be interesting. Or, hey. Will they do it? Uh, yeah, I think they're going to do it. I think the defender is going to have their hands full with Sigourney Weaver, ladies and gentlemen. She's yeah. going to be the bad guy, and you got to deal with bad Ellen Ripley, so you don't have time to go popping into Infinity War. I think that you might see a cameo, and we got this question on John Shep's Quarter yeah. Heroes panel at Comic Con this week. We talked ad nauseum about this with fans all weekend, and I think the bottom line is there is a concern that you cheapen the events that have already happened in their Netflix series by making them say, oh, that was more like a uh, job application to see if you were good enough to fight these intergalactic bad guys that the the Avengers mm. going to have to worry about. I wouldn't hate seeing a cameo from certain defenders in one of the Infinity War films. My concern is that it's hard to do a cameo because, look, let's face it, the story is not about the defenders. So they're going to pop in there. They're going to be ancillary characters. They're going to be a tertiary presence. And the fear is that it's just a cameo for the sake of having a cameo. The worst thing you could do with Infinity War is turn it into an Adam Sandler movie where there's just a bunch of famous ex-athletes at a Christmas party because Adam Sandler's friends with these people you know right. you don't want that to happen so if there was a way to get a cameo in there where there's a there's a bunch of cannon fodder running towards a street and and tony Stark was like oh don't worry about them i know a guy and then the punisher and luke cage show up in a van maybe that's cool but i don't know that that services the story you're trying to tell so i think that if i had a vote i would say we don't need to cross those streams right now one of the things i think they need to keep their eye on is like you're talking about don't play the short-term game, play the long-term game. Because mm -hmm. you're right, if I'm sitting in the theater and I'm watching Infinity War, and like you said, a bunch of cannon can fodder run down the street, and Luke Cage and Punisher and Daredevil we'll jump out of bed, crazy in the I'll theater. lose my mind. That would look amazing, but at what cost? Right. Like, and I think what Netflix is trying to do right now is play the long game, but I mean, it could be exactly as Christian's describing it. And I, I do think you're right, I think there's room I think there might be a room to do a cameo if it's handled the right way. I'm just not perhaps. a great enough person to, to think about how you do that. I'm yeah, sure that yeah. Marvel has those people, but I'm not the guy. All right, guys, I said we'd save a little bit of time at the end of the show for take some of your Twitter questions. And we're going to do that right now. So, Wendy, what have you picked out? Well, ever since we talked about the breaking news of Aladdin live action, the chat and Twitter Im immediately started speculating who's going to be cast as what, specifically the genie. Some names were thrown out, such as The Rock and Jim Carrey for the genie. And then A. Clay asked this, how would you feel about Lin-Manuel Lin Miranda as the genie? Wow, Lin Manuel is oh. not not a bad. I, I, that wasn't the first one in my head, to be honest with you. That's not a bad call. Here's the thing about The Rock: I, you can put The Rock in almost everything. He's franchise Viagra, absolutely. But you need what Robin Williams did with Genie is on such another level. You've got to get in somebody 
who can match that creativity, who can match, nobody has more charisma than The Rock, but charisma isn't the same as pure energy output. And you gotta get somebody who can do that. I, that's why I completely understand why a name like Jim Carrey would pop into your head at the same time. Lin-Manuel's not a bad idea. What do you think? I need to go back and watch. I haven't seen Hamilton. I'd like to see his performance on SNL this weekend because I, I heard it was great, but I haven't seen it. Uh, the Jim Carrey call is interesting to me, but I think there's another comedic actor that I think could step into those shoes a little bit better, and that is Eddie Murphy. I think it'd be a great comeback for Eddie Murphy. He still has that inside of him somewhere. He can tap into that energy that he brought to the clumps. I think Eddie Murphy's the right guy because it brings a comedic sensibility that Robin Williams had, but you're not trying to do the same thing with Robin Williams. That's the worst mistake you can make making this new Aladdin movie is trying to make a genie doing an impression of what Robin Williams was yeah. able to do. Make it a genie that has some of that same skill set, but takes it in a different direction. I think Eddie Murphy's the guy. Somebody else who can match that comedically, yet they would not try to just do a Robin Williams impression, mm -hmm. I believe is Mark Ellis. So we have nope. Ashley Moba nope. as Jasmine, Mark Ellis as Jeannie, and Christian Harloff as Aladdin. Love I'll play it. the wrong. Love it. <laughs> Christian yeah. and I are auditioning for the role of Abu the monkey. That, yeah. That's what yeah. we can do. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, Ryan Reynolds would be interesting too. But uh, I think, um, you know, if, if I was thinking about it too, and it probably would be in bad taste, but, I, but if you had uh, Jamie Costa, Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I've already, look, the guy is great at impressions. But he, there uh, goes your point about don't just do a Robin Williams well, impression. If you had to yeah. do a Robin if impression, you try Costa, to do a, you that's, that's what I guy, meant. Yeah. But, um, I, yeah, look, I don't know. I, I think that I like the Eddie Murphy romantic thought. But I Christian? think he's past his prime on, the, on this thing. You know, I think that someone they're probably going to look at someone like a Steve Carell or somebody, too. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know who they could get. Yeah, I don't hate the Jim Carrey pick, even though same thing. I'm still kind of – it's still – on the same vein mm -hmm. as Eddie, Eddie Murphy. Um, yeah, who, I don't know who's out there right now that could really hit it. I think that there's there's a ton of potential names until I hear that line. I'm going to go, wait a minute. Okay, that's perfect. Why don't we think about that? They're doing some sort of effects with it, though. They're doing some sort of like performance motion capture. Yeah. Just get your boy Andy Serkis. Andy Serkis, <laughs> please. <laughs> Just get the Be king great. of motion capture. Seriously. <laughs> All right, performance what's next? Capture. <laughs> so, but, sorry. <laughs> Coffin Builder 89 says, would a Gremlin sequel or reboot be something you'd like to see with today's special effects? I think it would be cool. They've been talking on and on. I mean, we, we've done, over the past three or four years on Movie Talk, we've had to have done two or three stories on, okay, now the Gremlin sequel's coming. Okay, now they're saying, oh, no, wait, now a Gremlin sequel is coming. I do think at some point there is going to be another Gremlins. I think it's past the point of sequels. I think now you're getting into the remake uh, era. Yes, I think it could very much benefit from modern storytelling. Look, when I go back and watch the original Gremlins, which I do from time to time, some of them do look, some of the scenes look a little bit just flat out cheesy. But I think this is one of those situations where it has to be a blend of modern visual effects with practical puppets. Like, nothing will ever replace the, the close-up tight shots of Gizmo as a real, the real fur and the real puppets, put, you know, real life into it. I think that, and then when he's got to run around and do action, then you take advantage of the modern special effects. Stripe, same thing. The close-up creepy stuff, you do one thing. Wider shots, when there's more action and movement, you go with another one. I think if you strike that kind of a balance, I think it can work. Now, I'd like to stay away from uh, Gremlins. I know Mark Riley's giving me the finger right now because he's got a uh, he's got a, a really good, actually smart prequel idea yeah. that he's talked about before for Gremlins. I just uh, what I'm worried about is there's just no way they would use the puppets. They would go CGI. They would go over CGI with it. They would do it would it would really I think kind of cheapen what the first one had with the magic. Now, granted, it's 1984, so it looks, you look at it now, it doesn't look as good, but back then, it, it, it did feel real. It felt, but the first one, not the second one was a parody of itself, and, was, and it was meant to be, but the, uh, I, I don't want to see them do it, and I don't, I think what Joe Dante and Spielberg brought to the original movie, it, almost, it felt more like a horror film than anything else, too, and I don't think that they would do that, so I, I'd kind of like to stay away from it. Mark, uh, over under 40%, the Defenders is actually Sigourney Weaver <laughs> unleashing a, a bunch of Mogwai fed after midnight on the Defenders I, in If the over was 80%, I'd say definitely under, but at only 40%, <laughs> this could happen, folks. Buckle your seatbelts. And I might have been on Christian's train, but when Mark Riley explained to me his idea for a prequel where it's Mr. Futterman, the crazy neighbor, Don't give it away. as a Don't young give it away. man, Don't give it away. I like the idea of yeah. it. I like the idea of what this thing could be because Gremlins 2 The New Batch did two great things. One, it was a very clever satire. Two, it completely ruined any chance going forward for that movie. So if you wanted to do it as a remake or a prequel, he explained the whole thing on our did show. He? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right? 
Yeah, you're fine. Go. All right. I just want to try and protect the guy. <laughs> Sec- it's not secure, having a good week. Secure the IP. All right, let's take two more. <laughs> All right, Darth Kalau says, speaking of Power Rangers, should they do a post credit scene to set up Tommy and the evil Green Ranger saga? It's it's okay. First of all, on on paper that sounds cool, but it's impossible. We've said this before to talk about what should they do for post credit scenes when we haven't seen the movie. It's kind of pointless. Like, what if they the movie does not lend itself to that? Then would a post credit scene setting up the Green Ranger make sense? No, obviously not. If the movie goes in such a way that that would be great, then sure. I do think though that while I really appreciate that they're staring, they seem to be steering away from the, the campy kind of old Power Rangers, I do think the Green Ranger is somebody that you probably would need to introduce at some point. Look, it all have to do with how they think the movie's coming together. Do they think there's going to be another one? We know that Lionsgate wants to make like 11 of these things and have a big, powerful franchise if they can. And one way to do that would be to introduce the Green Ranger, so I'd be good with it. Uh, yeah, sure. I have no idea. I think there will be a post credit scene of Power Rangers. I have no idea what it's going to be, but I think there will be. I don't have enough information. <laughs> I don't know enough about it. Yeah. All right, last question of the day. All right, Sterling Jones says, any truth to another Rogue One trailer coming out on Thursday Night Football? <gasps> makes sense. It makes sense. Okay, is there any truth to it? Straight up answers, I don't know. I don't know. Would I like there to be truth to it? Well, it would be great on a couple of reasons. One, we get a new trailer. Two, it would be giving me an excuse to make John uh, Schnapp watch another episode of football, right. uh, which is <laughs> not, football. not an easy thing to do around here. I, I, have you heard anything about this? No, but it makes a lot of sense. It won't have the same impact that obviously The Force Awakens had. It's just different anticipation levels for, for both movies, but I think it'll certainly do well, and it worked well for them the first time, and it, it got sure some extra did. eyes on football. So I think that it makes sense for them to do it. Mark? I am looking at the schedule for the Thursday night games coming up, and uh, it's going to be t- it's going to take too long. Yeah, should happen. Why not? Because then we get to talk about it. <laughs> the one thing I will say though is that if we don't hear anything about it, because remember when they did that with the Force Awakens, they made a big deal out of it because yeah. they wanted all the eyeballs in the world. This isn't going to be something that they would just <laughs> drop on Thursday night football. Ooh, I got it. Okay, so because Doctor Strange comes out a week uh, before uh, overseas than it does here, it would probably be the Thursday. October 27th Thursday night game which happens to be the epic matchup between the Jaguars and the Titans they, they need, need something to put eyes on that do. game yeah, Ooh, ain't nobody watching that game yeah. all right guys that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk thanks so much for joining us listen remember the most important part of this show is not what we have to say it's what you have to say jump into the comment section leave your thoughts on any or all the topics we discussed and make sure you take this video share it on Twitter on Facebook and wherever you do your social media lifestyle I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me first of all sitting to my left Mr. Mark Ellis Mark where can people find you online you can find me online at Mark Ellis live and check out Christian and I's movie review channel and all things movie related schmoes no I'll be at the Denver Comedy Works downtown this weekend get tickets at my site just try out which one bar of Mr. Aladdin sir what do your pleasure I have be? no idea, but I can show you the world. <laughs> oh, Wrong character, but that actually, you got good pipes. All right, Christian Harloff, where can people find you? <laughs> Don't uh, you dare close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this gets better. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say that you can find me at Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram. We got the team matchup from the Schmodown tomorrow. You have ETC, Ricky and Elliot going up against Greg and John from the Real Rejects. That's going down tomorrow, Tuesday. Make sure you check it out. Over there at that table, we got Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. Hashtag Ashley Mova for Jasmine. Yes. And of course, Wendy Lee. Wendy Lee, where can people find you? You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, simply at John Campia. And once again, make sure you subscribe to Comic Con HQ to watch mine and John Schnepp show Film HQ. Special thanks to all the guys in the room and a special thanks to you guys. Thanks for joining us. My name's John Campia, and until next time. Bye-bye. Tell me, hey guys, Chester, if you like this when video, did you click last the thumbs let up your button. heart Also, decide. make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider. <laughs>